Hello, my fellow comic book collectors. Today is Wednesday, and on Wednesdays, I do my Q&A, where I answer your questions that you asked me last week. So if you have a question you want answered in the next week's video, please put it in the comments below. Let's get into it. Uh, these are the questions that were asked for this week, and there's some really great ones here. I'll, I'll get right into it. Mr. E, the low-grade king, wrote, Love the artist segment. It was great. Could you do a show where you could do a show just on artists because there are a lot of great ones. My question is for you. Do you have any Marvel 35 cent variants and can you talk about the rarity of them? I acquired the Iron Fist 14, the 35 cents variant for $175. It is a low grade, maybe a 2.5. I didn't realize it was a variant until the next day. I just bought it for Sabretooth's first appearance. Well, you did really well <laughs> if you picked it up for the same price as um, the regular price variant. Um, or the regular price, I should say. Uh, the, the $0.35 cent ones, what they did was they wanted to test out the different uh, pricing you know, schemes. And so what they would do is they would test it out in a small market. Um, actually there's, I forgot what town it is, but there's a town in the U S where they actually, that town just gets completely screwed over in terms of pricing because what happens is, uh, they, they, in order to have a sale, uh, you first have to have sold the product at a certain price. So for example, let's say a shirt, uh, if you ever go to the super, like the, you know, a mall, uh, you'll see shirts or clothing always like 50% off and it's, there's always sales going on. But they the reason they do that is they, they're not actually allowed to do that unless they've sold the product at regular price sometime before. However, often that's not the case. What they'll do is they, they, they'll sell it at this one small town. <laughs> I forgot what the town is. It's just some small town. And... Um, they sell it at the regular price there and because they've sold it at the regular place then they'll sell it again at uh they'll sell it in the other places at 50 percent off or whatever the real price should be um it's it's a bit of a marketing scheme that they do just to encourage people to buy um but with the 35 cent variant it was the same idea that they would would do is they put it into a small test market to see how well people would buy those books at that higher price and then um you know if if it had no problem selling compared to what a 25 cent price variant would sell for uh then they would uh <laughs> they they would roll it out to the rest of the markets so um often what you would see is like very small uh distribution on the the 35 cent variants as much as one hundredth the size of just like in terms of the number of copies available. So the the thirty five price ascent variants are actually really rare um, and um, highly sought after by collectors. Usually they command anywhere from two to three times a premium on the price. So to get a a price variant, you did quite well, and especially. The price variants have a special significance, I should t say this, when it's on a key issue. So they didn't do these price variants that often. Um, there's a few key books, like uh, the Sabretooth one. Another one that they did it with was a lot of the Star Wars ones. So there's a Star Wars price variant uh, for the first few issues. But it's not a common thing. But when there's that great overlap where you have a first appearance plus a rare variant, it just creates extra hype around that comic. So you did extremely well. So, um, And as I said, collectors do seek those things. And one of the things that I found with this hobby is that variants, like UK price variants, Canadian price variants, and price these 35 cent price variants, can really command um, additional interest. So the people in the hobby want to find something that is rare and they will look for those little added features to find scarce, that make the book scarcer than some other book. 
I, I believe there was one other price variant, and you can comment below if I'm wrong on this, but I believe there is a price variant for um, Eternals, uh, the Eternals number one, that there's a 35% price variant for that as well. Uh, that book has tumbled a lot, but uh, I, th I believe that the 35 cent price variant for it has still, or I think it's a 30 cent price variant, but uh, it has still held its value. So <laughs> it's kind of interesting. Okay, uh, the next question is from Black Boxed Silver and Bronze. He wrote, Alan, this was a very enjoyable video. Uh, he's referring to last week where I looked at Golden Age artists. And um, he wrote, uh, continued, um, Baker, Cole, Schomburg are, are solid choices. I was surprised that you did not show or mention Johnny Craig for EC. Can you do the same thing next week for Silver Age? Yes, I can. And I actually believe, I, I thought I mentioned Johnny Craig because it was like I had a little piece of paper <laughs> where I wrote all the Golden Age artists that I like and that I think were significant. And I thought Johnny Craig was on that list. So um, this week I did the same thing again. I made my little <laughs> like, uh, list of artists that I think are cool and significant for the Silver Age. And some of these um, are ones that kind of go through the Silver Age. I mean, the Silver Age is from really 1956-ish. Like it's kind of one of those shifted dates. Um, to all the way up to 1969. So it's a 14-year period. Um, so there's a lot of artists that had careers that span much, much longer than that. So some of the uh, Golden Age artists, you know, are in here, and some of the Bronze Age artists are in here. Um, but I tried to pick artists that really made their significant contributions during the Silver Age. That is why um, one of the artists that I mentioned in the Golden Age I, you know, I, I was trying to say, oh, these are the top ones. One of them, a lot of people would say, oh, that's, he's one of the greatest artists of all time. And um, why didn't you say that he was the best? Well, I consider him a Silver Age artist. <laughs> so you'll see him on this list and I'll explain once I get there. But I'm going to start out with an artist that I really like um, that uh, I don't get, I don't believe he gets his, enough love for his artwork but I really enjoy his artwork, and it's Nick Curdy. Um, he did a lot of these, he did a run on uh, Aquaman, and it's just a really great run. Um, his artwork really stands out to me. Like, a lot of these artists that I'll show, I, I don't know, they don't really stand out as much. Like, in the Golden Age, it was like L.B. Cole, he stood out. <laughs> well, J Nick Curdy is one of those artists, to me, that really stands out in terms of his style. So I really enjoy this one. This is Aquaman number 30, 39. And it was really in from the 30s into the 40s that uh, Nick Curdy did. Okay, the next one is another artist. This is a standout artist. This is not necessarily his most famous artwork, but it is one that he did do. Uh, this is uh, Dan DiCarlo. Now, I probably should have shown a different representation of Dan DiCarlo, because Dan DiCarlo is really known for uh, his very sexy artwork. Uh, he does ones where um, usually, like Archie didn't really have many swimsuit <laughs> covers until Dan DiCarlo got involved. And you'll notice like in the 60s, that's when Dan DiCarlo was really at his peak from like all the, all through the 60s. And he was an Archie artist. Um, and it's just a, this is Josie number one. This is a Dan DiCarlo artwork. And you'll notice that he, he shows a lot of skin. <laughs> that's a that's a Dan DiCarlo trait. Um, so the next one is, is an artist that I'm not super familiar with. I know some of his pieces. But this is the one that stood out to me. I'm kind of trying to get out of the plastic. Um, and this is um, Nick Girando. Giro, ah, I'm going to totally brutalize his name. Jick, a uh, Dick, <laughs> uh, G or Dano, Giordano. Wow, I got it right the right last time there. 
So this is Joker number one, and this is just a really great cover. Um, his artwork was cited by other people as being very, uh, you know, symbolic of one of the top uh, artists from the Silver Age. I'm just not as familiar with him. I do know this cover and a few of his other covers. So, but, uh, you know, I, I, and I do like his artwork, so I, I'll give him credit. But I'm not just not as familiar with him. So he's lower on my list. <laughs> um, this artist actually should be high on the list. Uh, he is one that is definitely... Uh, one sec. Here, one sec. Uh, move things around. Is this one. Uh, John Morita Sr. Uh, this is uh, a classic cover. Um, probably he is, like, I would say... I, I didn't put him in my top five, though I do love his artwork. Uh, he is just, he is a great artist. Uh, this is, you know, first appearance of Kingpin. Uh, classic cover. Uh, Spider -Man, he's in Spider-Man number 50. And it's just a great cover by uh, John Morita. Um, it's just... <laughs> Um, I just think there's a few other Silver Age artists that I liked a bit better, <laughs> so I put him a little bit lower on the list. But he is one that is some, he did a major run on uh, Spider-Man books, um, and he is one that is significant for the Silver Age. So John Rita. Uh, the next one um, that is a very significant artist for DC is uh, Ross Andrew and um, Andrew Andrew so um, just you know he did a lot of really great covers um, also this was a Mike Esposito cover as well so it's kind of like a combination so you get two in one with this one <laughs> because it's two great artists uh, that are very representative of the Silver Age so this is um, Ross Andrew and uh, Mike Esposito. So two big artists from uh, Silver Age. And another one where they, they, they often work together. So another one, I just wanted to, sh since I, I'm only showing <laughs> one of each, uh, where they're, this is another one that they did together. Uh, this is Suicide Squad or Brave and the Bold number 25. Uh, just a really another, another great cover um, their artwork does stand out, um, and they often work together, so it's just kind of cool <laughs> that we have this. Okay, uh, the next one is kind of a major artist, um, and it's Gil Kane, just another classic artist. He did a lot of work for DC, um, and he did a lot of the iconic covers. So this is Showcase 22 which is a major key, <laughs> but it's a classic cover as well. And um, Gil Kane is considered one of the, the premier artists from uh, the Silver Age. So Gil Kane. Okay, so we're getting into my top few. These are my top five. And I kind of put them in order, but I didn't put them in order in terms of the way I put the books. Um, Sure, one sec here. I just gotta make sure. So, okay, that was higher. One sec here. Oh, okay, this one. This is actually one of my favorite covers from the Silver Age. Um, this is a John, a John Bazima um, cover. Uh, it's just a, he's a really great artist. Uh, and so I try to pick artists that kind of stood out amongst the Silver Age. And he, for me, was one of the ones that did. Um, I find whenever you see his artwork, it, it just stands out. I, 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 he did a major run on um, Submariner. And it just some really great covers that just like really pop. Like he, his use of colors and um, use of like, like, I don't know, the way uh, 
the way the whole uh, image is laid out is really outstanding. So John Bazima. Um, so just a yeah. So this is Submariner number five. It's just a classic tiger shark cover. Okay, now we're getting into my top five. <laughs> so I, I wanted to show a huge representation of the Silver Age uh, because you know there are some really standout artists. Um, this artist, or sorry, this is my top four. Um, this is my fourth one on my list. So originally, uh, somebody asked me who would be the you know four people from the Golden Age you'd put on Mount Rushmore, and so these are the four that I put on Rush Mount Rushmore to represent the Silver Age. Um, so the first one is one that I believe is kind of like. He just has so many covers that really represent uh, the Silver Age that if I didn't include this guy on the mountain, I, I felt like, wow, I, I really didn't explain the, the Silver Age that well. Um, and I'm going to show you this one, but I really probably show it, should show a different book, and I'll explain. So this is Flash 123, and this is a classic crossover cover uh, where you have Golden Age and Silver Age Flash. Now this is significant um, because uh, the same artist, and the artist is um, Carmen, Carmen Infantino, Infantino, and he is kind of the one that brought on the Silver Age. He's the, you know, um, Flash, um, like showcase number eight, <laughs> um, which is the first appearance of the Silver Age Flash, really is the book that's sort of the iconic book that defined the Silver Age in terms of DC books. Uh, it was the book that really said, this is the Silver Age, here we go, this is the start of the Silver Age. And um, his run on Flash is, is pretty impressive, where he did a lot of classic covers. So for me, you know, his significance for the Silver Age is huge. And I think, you know, <laughs> I, I think he should be mentioned. Um, so he did a lot of great covers. He didn't just do, he didn't just do Flash. He did a lot of great covers for uh, DC. Uh, Mystery in Space is another one that he did a bunch of great covers for. So Flash, 123, and it's uh, Carmen Infantino. And that's number four on my list. Um, the next one on my list would be... Um, and this one is just one cover I really love. I actually bought this, and I think a lot of people buy this, bought this book, this particular book, based on just the cover alone. It's just, it's a pure cover buy. It does have significance beyond the cover, but it is, is one of those things where people buy it for the cover. Um, it is this one. This is X-Men number 50, and it's by Jim Stranko. And it's just a beautiful cover. Like he just, like, just, it's, <laughs> I don't know what to say to describe it. It's just, it just stands out. It's one of those covers that really stands out. It's one of the X-Men covers that's considered one of the best um, of the early X-Men covers. Um, possibly the best of the early X-Men covers. Um, this one commands a premium just because of the cover alone. Uh, it is like the second appearance of Polaris and all this other stuff, but people buy it for the cover. And that's why I, I, I think Stranko is one of those artists that really does stand out. Um, so he was, would be definitely on my Mount Rushmore. He's my number three artist of choice. So this is Jim Stranko, and this is X-Men 50. Um, now another, or actually he's my third one on my list. Um... This is another artist that I really like. Um, I actually mentioned him in the Golden Age, and I'm going to mention him again in the Silver Age because he really did contribute most of his books in the Silver Age. And it was mainly on this title here, which is Amazing Spider-Man. Um, and it's Steve Ditko. Uh, just a phenomenal artist. He did so many covers. Um, I'm a big fan of the Green Goblin. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I always thought he was an interesting character for some reason. And I always liked this cover, strangely enough, with the slag tights and slag mites and all that kind of stuff. Um, just a really great uh, cover. Um, and 
a lot of his Spider-Man covers are really great. Like his Mysterio cover. Um, he just did a bunch of really great. He did Craven's cover and all those early uh, amazing Spider-Man covers are contributed to um, Steve Ditko. So it's just, he's just a major artist. So Steve Ditko cover. Um, and it's just, I don't know. He's one of the, he's one of the greats. So Steve Ditko. Now, this is the artist that I was talking about. This is my number one artist for the Silver Age. Um, and it's one that I actually mentioned in the Golden Age because he did contribute into the gold, from the Golden Age. He's, he's got a major career. This guy, his career kind of went all the way through. <laughs> and um, this cover is one that launched, in my opinion, um this character and made it the the name stay that it is today that you know everybody knows this character everybody knows this cover and it's because of the great artwork of this one artist and the artist is jack kirby and this is amazing fantasy number 15 just like this is just one of those covers that is just you, you just see it and then you go wow that's a cool cover and I believe, you know, when once they did this cover, they I think they knew that they had an instant success um, because it's just such a great cover. It's just so iconic. It's been homaged hundreds of times. Um, so, you know, Jack Kirby, uh, just one of the premier artists of the Silver Age. Uh, his run on Fantastic Four, another thing that really... You know, if it wasn't for Jack Kirby, there would be no Marvel. <laughs> it's just that level of how phenomenal this artist was and, in, and instrumental to the whole comic industry. I mean, his he was the one that did the covers for all of the Fantastic Four. Like, well, the major issues of Fantastic Four. Uh, he did the... the the Spider-Man ones. He did like so many books that are contributed to his artwork. So, um, yeah, <laughs> Jack Kirby, um, number one on my list of Silver Age artists that you should know about if you're going to know about the Silver Age. So just a phenomenal book. Super happy always to have that in my collection. I, <laughs> and I got it such a great price. I'm, I'm always happy that I, 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 you know, took the plunge when I did because uh, that book has really soared since. Okay, so that's that question. I hope that gives you some insight into the Silver Age in terms of some of the great artists from the Silver Age. Um, personally, I'm more fond of the artists from the Golden Age, and I, but I do appreciate these ones that I mentioned. Okay, next question is from Basil Graham. I want to get Batman 227 and 2... 32. Should I wait or would it be, will it get worse price wise? So I did answer this uh, when he commented it, but I felt like I really should have given a better answer. <laughs> I just should have said more. So my answer was um, that he should wait. And because right now, um, these are both iconic covers by Neil Adams. Uh, so it's uh, the Batman one where it's like him standing over the. Uh, dark uh, building uh like house on the hill and it's the the cover with um Ra's al Ghul uh first appearance so those are the two books he's talking about um so those books are always hot like they're they're books that are valuable regardless of Neil Adams or not but because of Neil Adams passing those books have gone another level up and they're really really highly priced right now whether or not they'll come back down is questionable um i think they will i i you know there's always that hype that initial hype and we're li still in that hype right now but once um some time has passed like i think three or four months uh the hype around neil adams and all of neil adams covers will fade and and the prices will drop uh, and i don't think they'll drop like 
to nothing but because these are like iconic covers and a lot of people do s still love neil adams covers uh it's just that uh that fire that is kind of put into people to cl to go out and grab these books will fade and uh, they'll move on to the next thing so there'll be a little less demand and that always brings the price down but i think uh long term these books these two books especially are ones that are iconic uh, Neil Adams artwork, but also uh, iconic books for Batman in general. Uh, and they are ones that will go up in value. I, I think there's so many people that are hyping uh, DC books right now that uh, I do see that there will be a trend where, um, you know, in the future, maybe one to two years from now, DC books will be starting to gain against their Marvel rivals. And it's really up to DC. You know, it's DC's battle right now, uh, whether or not they can produce the content to um, really create a new generation of interest in, you know, their properties. Like, DC has yet to make really good movies. <laughs> like, to the level of Endgame. Uh, Infinity War. Those those movies are just so um, powerful in terms of the hobby uh, that, uh, you know, it really excited a whole series of collectors. Like, if you look at the comic market in, like, 2015, it was almost dead. It was, like, really dying. And it was really the movies that really refueled the, the whole comic collecting market. And it was because it was Marvel movies that did that. Well, DC movies um, just haven't done that. They they've been good. I I do like. I did like the last Batman movie. I mean, it was okay. There was parts of it that annoyed me, but but for the most part, it was good. Um, you know, but it wasn't great. It wasn't like wow, this is the best movie ever. I I I have to watch it a million times. No, it wasn't that level. So. Uh, once DC can start producing that kind of level, then we'll see DC books really rising to that level. And we'll see these ones like by Neil Adams um, really rising to that level. Uh, you know, they should be much more expensive. Like, we think that the prices are high now. <laughs> if they were treated like Marvel books, they'd be like two, three times the price. They're They're still undervalued for what they are. But... That's that's DC versus Marvel. Okay, um, the next question, the last question actually, uh, is from Robots versus Folks number one. Uh, nice series. I would like to see a video about all your pedigree copy com uh, pedigree copy books. Okay, so I'm going to show you not all of my pedigree books because I, there's a few that I couldn't find. <laughs> I have to have to search a bit better. Uh, I just have too many slabs. I have like so many boxes of slabs that I have to go through, but there's about three or four that I have that I just don't know where they are. Um, they're not really organized. And I, I don't remember which books had the pedigrees <laughs> in those cases, because it's one of those ones where it's a pedigree uh, that is not um a, a gold label if they were gold labels it would be easy for me to remember which books it were they were but it's books that just have like um the old style where it's like just like a little mark that says this is from such and such a collection but i'm going to show you some pedigree books um that are gold labels and some that aren't and i'll show you what i mean by that so the first one is a book i really love i love this book this is just a great book uh, this is Crime Detective number nine, and it is the from the Seduction of the Innocent. Um, Seduction of the Innocent, for those who are not familiar, was a book written, written by Frederick Wortham uh, that basically caused the end of the golden age of comics. And Frederick Wortham was one of those people that was just like so obnoxious <laughs> in terms of activism. He was just very active. And he was always speaking out against comics. And it just drove a lot of the people that were making these comics crazy. Because, you know, he was really discouraging people from reading their books. And so this book um, has him on the cover. So this is what Frederick, 
Frederick Wortham looked like if he was gagged and bound. <laughs> so basically they are commenting, this is their social commentary against Frederick Wortham. That he just, he's just annoying in their minds. So, it, so later uh, when he wrote The Seduction of the Innocent, he included this book as, uh, as something where they were uh, working against him. So I thought that was interesting. Okay, uh, so that's um, Crime Detective um, number nine. And that's from a pedigree called The Promise Collection. And I've mentioned The Promise Collection before. It's basically uh, a story where um, there was two brothers and uh, a younger brother and older brother. The younger brother had this amazing, uh, like really amazing collection of comics. And they were both sent off to, to fight in the Korean War. So the younger brother asked the older brother, hey, can you watch my funny books if something bad should happen to me? And so the older brother promised, and that's the name of the collection, it's called the Promise Collection. Um, uh, he promised to take care of the books and um, the, the younger brother did die in the Korean War and uh, the older brother kept that promise up till his death and um, the books were then discovered and they're an amazing collect. It's a, like with pedigrees, it's usually an amazing collection that are high degree, uh, high grades. I mean, high grades uh, that are from one particular collector who probably bought them off the off the comic shelf uh, racks themselves. Like so, these are that's a very um, uh, those are the criteria usually for a pedigree. That's high grade, big collection. Uh, of rare books uh, bought f by an original owner. Uh, so that's what usually qualifies to be a pedigree. Um, my, uh, the Mile High is the most famous pedigree. Uh, this Promise Collection is a recent one that has gotten a lot of excitement as well. And I got a few books from the Promise Collection. So I'm going to show you some more from the Promise Collection. And I'm going to show you one that's kind of interesting because it's not in a slab. <laughs> so it's uh, this one. This is Scarlet O'Neill number one. And it's, you know, kind of a cool book. I like Scarlet O'Neill. Um, but it's not in a slab uh, because it's one of the lower grade ones from the collection. I mean, I'm not saying it's like really, really low grade. It's a VG fine or 5.0. Um, but that is considered a low grade for the Promise Collection, where you have like these books like the one I just showed where they're in the nines. So um, often they didn't bother slabbing the ones that are in lower grades. So this one, kind of a cool book, but not slabbed. But because I got it at auction, they do provide a certificate from Heritage uh, saying that this book is indeed from the Promise Collection. So, and like certifies it basically. So I thought that was kind of interesting. So that's a pedigree book without the pedigree slab. <laughs> so kind of interesting. Another one that's kind of the same idea is this one. This is um, a, a weird fantasy number 16. This is another Soti book uh, or Seduction of the Innocent book. Uh, just a really great, you know, book from the Seduction of the Innocent. Um, and this one is got another certificate of authenticity this comes from the johnny craig collection so it says uh hi kitties this document certifies this comic book comes from the personal collection of johnny craig who worked on uh ec group from 1947 to 1956 and it just shows and it has like it's signed by the you know somebody that uh, authorizes it so that's kind of cool. So this is a kind of pedigree uh, because it does come from one of the major artists uh, from EC Comics. So it's from his personal collection, which is kind of cool. Bit of a pedigree, but not like a traditional pedigree. Okay, and the last one from the Promise Collection that I have, and this was my first gold label book. <laughs> it was, for a long time, it was my only gold label book. Uh, this is Crown Comics number four, or three, number three, I should say. And this is just a really great book as well. It's a Matt Baker cover. He's just one of my favorite artists from the Golden Age. 
and it is um, also the first appearance of the first black uh, superhero, or not, without the superpowers, hero, I should say. Uh, so just a really cool book, um, and, you know, it would be considered a low grade for the Promise Collection, even though it's high grade for the Golden Age, it's like a 7.5, but a lot of the Promise Collection books were really well kept. So um, this is uh, Crown Comics number three. It's just a really cool book. I really like it. Okay, so that's my, uh, <laughs> my um, pedigree collection. I, I don't really go out, you know, seeking pedigree books. So I don't really have that many in my collection. But, uh, you know, I, I actually wanted to get one Promise Collection book. And it was so funny. I, was, I kept on bidding on random books. Like, just random ones that I thought, nobody's going to bid on this because it's just, it's not a key. It's not a great cover. <laughs> it's just like some random book that they happen to slab. And every time... I think because it was the early stages of the Promise Collection when it first was released, the books were going three, four times fair market value. So I was like, no, I'm not going to pay that much for some random book. Uh, it just happened they had one book that I did need, uh, which was the, you know, um, Crown Comics number three. I did want that book. I do like getting these kind of iconic history books. Um and, you know, I actually got it at fair market value, considering it, even though it's in a pedigree, I got it for fair market value. I think because people kind of see the covers a little bit, they think it's racist, even though it's really not. Um, they, you know, they didn't want to bid on it. So it was pretty great. So I got it for fair market value, which is pretty great. So um, that has been my pedigree collection. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, if you have questions that you want to see answered next week, please comment below with your questions and I will do my best to answer them. Thanks again for watching. Bye for now.